Well, I have to say that I uh, envy those of you who have embraced um, as a meditative practice yoga. Uh, because when you describe to others how it's a meditative practice for you, people take you as a legitimate practicer. I have my own meditative practice. It's internet shopping. <laughs> when I tell people that, they usually do what you just did, and they don't take me seriously. But when I observe myself in the practice of internet shopping, I have to say that I'm very aware of my breath. I'm aware of my heart rate. I'm aware of my posture. And I'm also aware that I can shut out the rest of the world and just focus in a mindful way on one single thing. But I'm really not here to talk with you about internet shopping. I'm here to talk with you about something different, which is biointegrity. And to my great satisfaction, I checked again this morning, and there is no entry in Wikipedia for biointegrity. So I get to say whatever I want. <laughs> This is one of my more recent internet purchases. Uh, it's called a PJ Reef. This was uh, one of those Kickstarter campaigns, and I came to find out after having done some research that there are a lot of people who are trying to make a microcosm of the universe in a jar, in the form of a reef. I've seen them on the internet as small as a thimble. Uh, this one is about the size of a mason jar, and, and really what I, I like about it, besides the, the beauty of it, is what it does for me on a daily basis as I think about systems theory and what my job is. Because it's easy for me to get consumed in my work in the day-to-day. -day. Every day something new comes up that I have to deal with. But my main job is to assist the College of Business and Economics here at Western in establishing and executing a strategic vision that is consistent with the mission of the university, Active Minds Changing Lives. This does that for me because it reminds me that there's a bigger world out there, a world that I learned about when I was in the fourth grade. When I'm nine years old and walked outside, I imagined that it was a world of limitless possibilities. And then I was told, as we studied science as, as nine-year-olds, that we're actually traversing on a very thin crust of planet. And underneath that is a molten core of Earth. And that if I climbed the highest mountain on the planet, I wouldn't be able to breathe because there would be so little oxygen in the air on that planet. That we occupy a very narrow band of life. And that nature recycles everything. Waste is food, as the environmentalists put that. All of that is wrapped up in my PJ Reef. So I want to talk about, as a springboard, just a couple examples of biomimicry. Some of you may be familiar with those. Then a definition of moral integrity, because that's something that's really captured my attention recently. And then bridge the two by proposing that we can learn how to be better human beings if we just pay attention to nature. That's the real takeaway, that there are lessons in nature that will help us be better human beings. The first example of biomimicry is the bullet train in Japan. Now, when the train first went into service, it had been designed in such a way that made a lot of sense from an engineering point of view. If you want to build a train that's going to ride on tracks and going to go over 200 miles per hour, you want to make sure that those tracks are straight and that they're level. You don't want to have the train going up grades or down grades, and you cert certainly don't want it to try to turn sharp corners at 200 miles an hour. So what do you do? Well, you have to tunnel through the natural barriers that you're going to encounter as you build those tracks. And that means you have tunnels. So the first experiment in running the bullet train resulted in something that the engineers hadn't exactly anticipated. And that was that at the front end of the train, which was much blunter than what you see here in this photo, there was a buildup of air pressure as the train went through the tunnel that resulted in a very large sonic boom as the train exited the tunnel. And the longer the tunnel was, the more the compressed air and the louder the boom, and it could be heard for two miles away. Now, you can imagine that the citizens living in those areas were complaining about the fact that the train was interfering with the quiet use and enjoyment of their property. <laughs> and certainly it was. And so the engineers were presented with a problem. How do we solve this problem of the noise? And they found a solution in nature. The Kingfisher is known to be a stealth bomber. 
what it does is when it dives into the water, if you have, if you ever have seen a, a kingfisher diving into the water after prey, it leaves virtually no wake at all. You don't see concentric circles radiating out from the bird. And it's largely because of the shape of its bill. The engineers, being the smart engineers that they were, said this might be a solution for the train. And they reimagined the nose cone on the bullet train as a profile of the kingfisher and put this into service, and it worked. Not only did it end the sonic booms, it also solved another problem, and that was that the trains had some other inefficiencies built into them. So now the bullet train, with this nose configuration, can travel 10% faster than it could, using 15% less energy. I love this idea of biomimicry. It's learning from nature. It's the idea that nature for millennia has had a time to learn lessons that we haven't had nearly as long to learn and we can borrow from. This looks to be perhaps a pop art piece of work hanging on the wall, but it's, it's not that at all. What it is is an aerial photograph of a port. What you see along the top are what are called intermodal containers. Now, the idea for an intermodal container came about in 1953 when someone thought it's really inefficient for us to use longshoremen and uh, you know, equipment that is things like um, you know, hand trucks to offload uh, freight from ships, that's what you see along the bottom, by hand. What if we containerize it? And we have to standardize that. I mean, this is an innovation in transport. The way you standardize it is you come up with a standard eight by eight foot container, 20 to 40 feet long, it depends. You have cranes now that offload these. And it was a brilliant idea that took decades to implement because you had to change the whole infrastructure of the port system. I'm sure you had to get some agreement from the Longshoremen's Union as well to make this transition. That probably was the biggest barrier. But the problem is that by some accounts, and I have to admit the accounts vary widely, there are as many as seven or 800,000 abandoned intermodal containers in this country every year. The reason for that is that we have a trade deficit for the country, from the countries from which we buy things. They ship them to us in the containers. The containers don't go back with goods from us because we're a service economy. So what happens to these seven or 800,000 containers? Well, lots of interesting things happen to them now. Not 10 years ago, but now we see that we're converting them into housing and attractive housing, habitable housing at that. But again, this isn't a new idea. Because if I ask you to imagine what a hermit crab looks like, you probably think of something like this. And what you have here is actually a creature that looks more like you and I. It looks like this, okay? It's frail, it's hairless, it's vulnerable, it's not well designed to survive its prey. So what does it do? It finds a way to appropriate protection from somewhere else, something that's been abandoned, a shell. So I would say that our use of intermodal containers also is not a new innovation. This is biomimicry. If you want more examples, uh, you can go to asknature.org. It's one of my favorite websites. And you'll find dozens and dozens of examples of this sort of, of biomimicry. I want to shift for just a moment to talk about the moral concept of integrity and then reunite that with this idea of biomimicry. I got frustrated a few years ago because I'm a moral philosopher by training, but I do research with organizational behaviors and organizational theorists, and I started reading about how they were studying leadership and how the, the notion of integrity impacted leadership. And what I learned was that a follower's assessment of a leader's, their willingness to follow a leader is largely a function of whether they not, or not they, the follower believes the leader has integrity, that they're a person of integrity. But I do have academic training, so I wanted to look and see how is integrity measured in that research. And I found out it was almost all about honesty. You would have one or two items. So if I believe that the leader is honest, I'm willing to follow her. Well, that's dissatisfying to me as a moral philosopher. So I started doing a literature review and spent a few years doing that and distilled it down to five characteristics of integrity. And by the way, my proposition here is going to be that, that Nature does a much better job of demonstrating integrity than you and I do. The first part of that definition about how we live our lives, are we going to live as an angel or a devil, is that we have to have coherence among a set of moral values. 
Now, we're on message with this in the College of Business and Economics. When we teach about coherence among a set of moral values and moral frameworks, we're talking about principles. Do our actions conform to important principles? Do they create more benefit than harm? Are they fair? Do they demonstrate caring? Do they promote personal liberty and choice? Beyond the behaviors, are they consistent with good character? And finally, what is their impact on the planet? And the best decisions are ones that meet the requirements of all of those. But that's not enough, because jihadists have a very consistent set of moral values. The KKK adherent has a very consistent set of moral values, but it fails the second part of the definition of integrity. That set of moral values has to have some consistency with a set of social values. And what I'm presenting here is a very linear model, which is how it has been published. I'm going to challenge that in a moment. But it's not just about what you believe. It's also about your behavior cohering with your beliefs. And then there should be consistency over time and across social contexts or across the roles that we play. What can nature teach us about integrity? What can nature teach us about how to lead a better life? I was fascinated when I saw the following picture. Why is the root structure of this tree organized in the way that it is? And it becomes pretty clear when you take a closer look. The tree is a complex adaptive system. It is goal-seeking, and what it's seeking is water, and it's seeking nutrients. But there's a barrier there. There's bricks. So where do the roots grow? They naturally gravitate toward the cracks between the bricks, and they force themselves through those cracks so they can get into the soil and draw their nutri nutrients and water out of that soil. As I think about this definition of integrity, for me, if you look at the first two components of integrity, coherence among a set of moral values is rather like the roots. And the bricks are the social norms within which we operate. But it's really not quite that simple. Because what I've modeled here is no longer a linear process. It's a circular process, which is mostly what we see in nature. Think about how we understand the lives that we should live. Let's start with our own country. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that we are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights, that among those are life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Fast forward 80 years, four score, right? You know the rest. What did our forefathers have? A system based on personal liberty. And so there's, when one person stands up, whether they're saying it or doing it, they can reshape social values. A person who says, without saying any words, hell no, who stands up in the back of a bus and walks forward and says, this is where I'm going to sit. A person who, in China, a student says, I don't like the way that the direction of our government is heading, and stands in front of a tank, and we all have that image in our head. That's also this mutual simultaneous shaping, this co-evolution, this emergence that we see in social values and moral values. I think we've simply made them too, too distinct over time. And there are many other examples, not necessarily a personal liberty. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Those reshape our attention on social goals and social norms. And there are caring norms as well. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shores. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. And millions of immigrants have seen that in New York as they've entered this country. So what I'm suggesting to you in closing is that they, we need to create a bridge, a bridge between nature and what nature has to teach us and personal integrity so that the, what we understand about ourselves as moral persons is informed by nature, who I have to say in many cases is so much smarter than we are. Nature can teach me to be a better person. And I'm really excited to wake up tomorrow, and I hope you are as well, and wonder what will nature teach me tomorrow about being a better person? Thank you.